I want to call to order the regular scheduled council meeting for Monday, November 25th, 2019. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk Santos, roll call, please. First District Councilwoman Myrna Maldonado. <clears throat> Third District Councilwoman Brenda Walker. Present. Fourth District Councilwoman Christine Vasquez. Present. Fifth District Councilman Robert Garcia. Present. Sixth District Councilwoman Gilda Orange. Here. Councilman at Large Richard Medina. Present. Councilman at Large Emiliano Perez. Present. Councilman at Large Kenneth Monroe. Council President Lenny Francisco. Present. Uh, clerk, uh, for the record, Councilman Monroe is under the weather and Councilwoman Maldonado is out of town. <clears throat> I believe the minutes will be read on the next meeting. Is that correct, Clerk? Yes, Mr. President. Do we have any communications from the mayor? I believe we do have one. Yes, Mr. Cunningham, construction <clears throat> manager. Okay, Doug Cunningham, construction manager for the city of East Chicago. Um, the mayor want me to make sure people understand that the traffic control systems that has been in the middle of Columbus Drive is not a city project. It is a school city project. And we've gotten a lot of calls as to why it took so long. Um, whatever the issue was, <laughs> We just want to make sure people understood it's not a city project. I think that's a mute point now because uh, it has since been removed. The other item that I wanted to address was pertains to the parking lot that the city installed on Broadway. Um, I was at the board meeting several weeks ago taking questions concerning about did the city install this parking lot for the church? And we explained then that we did not, that the businesses in the area needed additional parking and that we had provided that parking for all citizens. Since then, Councilman Garcia has requested uh, the contract information for the project and invoice and I will provide that for you. To further clarify the city's position, I've asked the pastor of the church to come forward. Good evening, Council. Pastor Donald Ramirez of the Cross Church in East Chicago. Um, it is uh, a municipal parking. Um, we do share it with the rest of the residents in the community. Um, we've been fine since then. We don't have any issues. I haven't heard any complaints or concerns um, during the Mex even the Mexican Independence Day parade I've communicated with ECPD and Public Works and we created a good system and flow and my staff knows not to tell people they can't park there if they ain't coming to the church because it's municipal parking so I mean I think it's been working out great I think you know the people been utilizing it the business has been utilizing it and you know we have over 300 members on a Sunday and I think it's beneficial and people can still go and do what they need to do um, in that area and those businesses and you know it hasn't been a problem I think it's it was a good thing that the city you know uh, met the need of the community thank you sir. very much okay. um, we've done uh, these time for parking facilities throughout the city by subway we will continue to do it on an as needed basis if anyone has any question as to why we put in parking, it's because the citizens need it. If they have any more questions, please contact. Thank you very much. Councilman Percy. Yeah, uh, Mr. Cunningham, um, it's just funny because the only business is there is Fuentes. So I, I can no hear you. Can you speak up? There's no additional business but Fuentes there. You said additional business, business parking. 
the only business. I said we we are con continue to provide additional business parking as needed throughout the city. Yeah, what I'm saying on that corner, of course, it's been there for the longest, and all of a sudden that parking lot came up. So that's why I questioned it. Um, I, I have a parking to, lot by subway. You talking about? We put in a new. We put an additional park by subway. I happen to attend. Uh, go to the uh, restaurant in that area. I noticed that uh, we could not find parking at the time when we did um, transfer the property over to the church, and I saw that the other businesses needed additional parking. So we brought that up and we provided the parking. There's a hall that they have a lot of events in, and they use that parking lot when. Thursdays and Fridays? Yeah, they do like on Friday nights they have uh, events they have there, whether it's King Chianas or whatever. Excuse me, I just want to keep it to the parking lot, not to the events, to the church and stuff. Well, that's the whole purpose of the park. The the business businesses. Business. But what in what the I'm air. saying is that by subway, you said you mentioned subway. This yeah. stay on the subway. What 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 parking lot did you do by subway? It was uh, next to it? Yeah. So subway doesn't own that parking lot? No. And we will continue to put parking spots. I, I noticed even down on the Main Street area, a lot of the businesses are, don't have proper parking, and they need proper parking. They're not surviving. And if 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 the city owns the property, and we feel there's a need, we will continue to do so. Councilwoman Vasquez. Yeah. So, um, Councilman Garcia, I'm not questioning your concerns, but I just wanted to ask, like uh, Pastor Ramirez mentioned, so. Um, the restaurants can park. The restaurant parks there too. Yes. Let me check on. They park there. Yes. And then the hall rentals that they have for those parties. There's not a problem with them using that parking lot. Yeah, everybody's using. Because I always see it full. <laughs> yes. And I don't believe yes. that church is in session at that time. So all those other. Correct. Things. Okay. That is because I know that parking. for a while they did have. They do have a lot of problems with the parking for that restaurant because they yes. have a lot of customers during yes. the day. Yes. So they can all use it at any hour. They don't have to come and ask. They can just yes. park there. That's yes. what I wanted. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Orange. Councilwoman Orange. It may be helpful then that way um, Councilman Garcia doesn't have that problem if they put up municipal parking. That way people know that they can park there. They can put a sign there. Okay. And just put municipal parking. We, we, they do have it in several other places. But I know the one right behind where the old... Um, Vision family and children is is municipal parking. People right. do park back there, even people from the apartment building. So right. there are a few of them, uh, you know, through the city. But I'm glad that you clarified the um, that mess we had on Columbus Drive because I got like 150 calls from all over places. People saying it was the city and wanted the city council to do stuff, but uh, I informed them it was the school city. Yes. So I'm glad you are clarifying that so people know when they was getting mad at the city that it was not the city's uh, problem. Yeah, and, we, and, and in that case, because they are part of the city, we did a system. The city did a system quite a bit in some of those issues in the street um, because they're tying into our system. So we did our due diligence. Okay, any more questions? Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on, do we have any communications from department heads? Yes, Mr. President. Council Bill Born, 112519CC, 11 11519LA, and 112519BD. So I'll move, Mr. President. Second. Motion was made by Councilwoman Vasquez, seconded by Councilwoman Walker. To accept accounts payable warrants as read. Have any questions on the motion? Clerk Santos, roll call, please. Walker? Yes. Vasquez? Yes. Garcia? No. Orange? Yes. Medina? Yes. Perez? Yes. Francis? Yes. Payroll warrant? <coughs> Bi-weekly, 111519. Oh, Mr. President. Second. Motion was made by Councilman Garcia, seconded by Councilwoman Vasquez to accept payroll warrant by weekly 111519. 
Have any questions on the motion? Clerk Santos, roll call, please. Walker? Yes. Basquin? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Orange? Yes. Medina? Yes. Perez? Yes. Franciski? Yes. Do we have any committee reports? We still have. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we have oh, Kevin Klosak, the IT director, and as follows would be the chief with them, and also Dr. Z, the utility director. Good evening, members of the council. Kevin Klosak, system administrator for the city of East Chicago, and uh, you all should have received a uh, a memo in your packet that. Uh, kind of briefed on what I wanted to um, update the council on with regards to IT projects. Um, the first project that uh, I want to um, brief you on uh, is in regards to our fiber optic network in the city. The city currently has and owns um, 15, approximately 15 miles of fiber optic cable throughout the city. Um, five miles of that being uh, installed in shared conduit that we've been able to share with uh, with NDOT for the uh, interconnects along the, the major ro uh, roads and thoroughfares. And since installing that, um, those interconnects have become uh, full with cable between the city and NDOT. Uh, there have been issues when the city has gone in to work on their fiber and things have uh, been noted to happen with NDOT's fiber and vice versa. When they've gone in, uh, there have been issues with our fiber. So to eliminate that, we, uh, we put out an RFP to construct the final five miles of conduit that would tie to the city's network. And then uh, upon completion, the city would have 100% uh, uh, interconnect uh, conduit and fiber throughout the city. And we would not have to rely on NDOT for their, uh, for their um, conduits. That project was uh, advertised and it was, uh, bids were opened up at the uh, Board of Works two, uh, meeting two weeks ago. We did receive two bids and we are in the process of still reviewing those bids uh, to um, possibly award to, um, to one of the contractors. Any questions for uh, Mr. Klops? Councilman Garcia? Yeah, uh, hey Kevin, how you doing? Fine. I see uh, citywide security camera system enhancements. What enhancements are those? That that's the next item. Okay. I'm I'm just speaking on the fiber network right now. All right. I will. That's the next item. Okay. Are there any questions on the, the any fiber questions network for the, itself? On the fiber, then. Councilwoman Orange. When will it be finished completely, Kevin? Um. I would say it's never fully finished, only because <coughs> as we do road projects in the city, complete construction uh, or reconstruction, we always uh, make it mandatory that they include conduit to expand the network. Um, this improvement here, if we were to let that project to install the five miles of conduit, that would take approximately uh, three to four months to complete. But as far as the network it, it itself goes, it's uh, it's constantly growing based on the uh, the constant construction that you know that we're doing in the city. Does that answer your question? Yes, okay. Any other questions for uh, Kevin about the fiber optic lines? All right, we'll move on to the next piece of business. Okay. With that, I'll turn the podium over to Police Chief uh, Hector Rosario to address the issues with the uh, security cameras. Good evening, Council. Hector Rosario, Chief of Police, East Chicago Police Department. Uh, I think we're looking at 11 more stationary cameras that we want to put in the neighborhoods. I believe they passed a map out to you guys. And we're looking at nine stationary license plate reader cameras, which would cover the entry and exit points of the city. That way we know who's coming in and who's leaving out the city. Any questions for the Chief? Councilwoman Orange? I have you up here to make this. It's not it about this, but... Um I know that Councilman Garcia said he was going to have a meeting about that towing, and uh, so far he has not had that meeting. But point of order, Mr. President. I can ask any question I want as long as he's up there for point of order, nothing. Uh, so Continue. 
hopefully that we can get that uh, meeting so that you can come back and talk about that. Thank you. Councilman Garcia. President, the uh, meeting was going to be scheduled last week, but uh, I guess he was out of town. Some other people was out of town, so he uh, couldn't make that meeting. So it was told me that meeting was going to be this Wednesday. So the meeting was planned, but since uh, there was you and some other people out of town, we couldn't have it. So. As long as you share with us when, when the meeting is, Councilman. Um, we was planning Wednesday uh, evening. Uh, I was going to meet with you um, and your deputies, chiefs, uh, discuss that. This Wednesday? Yes. Okay. What time and where? Uh, they're supposed to get back to me. <coughs> okay. I was going to meet with uh, with them and then have a committee meeting. Okay. After that. Any other questions for the chief? I got one. Councilman chief. Perez. Chief, on the license plate readers, are those fixed, or are you going to be able to move those around? They're fixed cameras, basically, on the road. That way, it's picking up the cars entering and leaving out the city. Okay, so those are not easily movable? To those other don't areas. pan. They don't do anything. They're strictly just to read license plates. That's all their job is, to read license plates. Okay. Councilman Garcia. Yeah. Um, was this the location supposed to have been in this packet or a different packet? The location. I'm sorry. Location is supposed to have been in this packet? Yes, they. Oh, sorry, uh, the clerk secretary should have emailed you a PDF of the map, but I did also print those out um, yeah, for tonight. The other one. So it's the second sheet on your map there. <clears throat> Councilwoman Orange. Chief, uh, you also have uh, the readers, the license plate readers, in certain cars also. It's a total of four vehicles. Yes. Yeah, Chief, uh, any around, I don't see nothing around Markstown area. Is there a reason? We're waiting for them to finish Klein Avenue. That way we could get the conduit over the, the canal. Any other questions for the Chief? Thank you. Thank you. I had I one more item uh, regarded, or related to our fiber network. So the IT department has been working with um, the uh, utilities division, and uh, we have since um, networked the Todd Avenue um, above ground water storage tank pump station uh, with fiber and uh, network that to uh, the city's network. So they are now going to be able to monitor all the PLC activities and and uh, whatever. And there's also um, I believe two cameras going on that facility that will be monitored as well. Uh, that is complete, and we have it on the uh, drawing board to do the same at the uh, the other above-ground storage tank in the harbor. Um, and I believe uh, Doc had something to add as well. Uh, President Member, this is uh, Dr. Abdurrahman Zahrawi, Utility Director for the city. So for... Um, the four million gallon tank that we have in Todd Avenue, so it's on service. It has passed all the tests, maybe leaks and bacteria. So we are just doing some programming for the SCADA system to be transformed the data direct to the filtration so we can monitor the system. Uh, other update is uh, for the filtration plants, as I talked last time, we are receiving last three new modules that has been, uh, will be shipped directly from Australia to, to the site, and they will be in service maybe mid-January, then will be done by the filtration. Councilman Garcia? Yeah, what is PLC stands for, PLC data? Uh, the PLC is a programming language uh, control system. So it's, it's bringing all the data, and you control the data by it, then you send it to the SCADA, then another software from the SCADA, you retrieve all the data. We work, uh, if you remember, I talked last time, we are working, maybe next year we'll be doing uh, real-time monitoring, and we are working on the system. So it will be implemented May, June 
2020. Any other questions for Doctor? Continue. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen of the council, I'm Anthony DeBonis Jr., legal counsel to the East Chicago Sanitary District. Uh, we had prepared, we have prepared tonight a presentation for you on the proposed rate increase of the sanitary district and the plan, the long-term control plan project phase two that it will support. Uh, the, Dr. Zarawi uh, will participate in it, but I wanted to introduce to you a number of people who are here who are, have been consultants on this project uh, who are going to speak to you this evening, although not everyone I introduce will be speaking try to keep this as short and as to the point as possible. Uh, before I do that, I want to notice, uh, bring to your attention a few things. Uh, you should have received some documents that look like this. These are PowerPoint slides. Uh, your copies of PowerPoint slides are going to show you in the course of the presentation. Uh, you should also have received uh, letter from Mayor Copeland on November 19th with some additional materials concerning uh, the long-term control plan, the legal basis for it. Uh, prior to that, of course, we did a May. Dr. Zarawi sent you some materials. Uh, tonight, we, we sent you a, the, there's a new ordinance. The only thing we changed was one <coughs> cut and paste error. Which, which did not affect anything. But uh, you should each have one of these uh, ordinances. It is identical in every other respect to the ordinances you've seen since I uh, did the first set of corrections a week or so ago. Um, I would like to, at this time, very quickly introduce people who are with us. Uh, Mr. William Biller is financial advisor of the uh, East Chicago Sanitary District. He is here. Uh, Mr. Scott Chin, who is a partner with the law firm of Fabry, Fagri, Baker & Daniels in Indianapolis. Th that firm is our bond counsel. Uh, you'll hear Mr. Chin in a moment talk to you about the legal background of this project and uh, issues that uh, arose that are legal issues that you should know about. Uh, we have with us the engineering firm of Butler, Fairman, and Seifert, who have offices in Indianapolis and Merrillville. Uh, Jake Damerell, who's vice president of that company, is here with us. Uh, Matt Spidell, who's the uh, project manager, and Cameron Wright, who's a project engineer. Um, we also have with us the uh, outside financial advisors from Baker Tilly Municipal Advisors. This is the successor company to H.J. Umbaugh, who for many years uh, are one of the financial advisors for the city. Mr. Andre Riley, this gentleman right here, who is going to talk about the uh, development structure and content of the proposed rate increases. And Mr. Eric Walsh, who is also CPA, as is Mr. Riley, who's going to talk very briefly about the features of the bond issue. Uh, we're, we're here, of course, to ask you to adopt uh, ordinance number 2019-27, I believe it is, uh, which you have later on the agenda. Uh, this is an important matter because the City of East Chicago is under legal compulsion through a court order to make certain improvements in its long-term control apparatus. This is, this is the uh, project which is going to finally address the issue of keeping wastewater out of our basements, low areas, and places it shouldn't be when we have storm events. Uh, 
we as many communities have this problem and we built the first phase of this system uh, several years ago we're now about to start phase two unfortunately it's an expensive undertaking uh, as you will see in the presentations coming up we are in better shape than many communities in this regard but the board of commissioners of the sanitary district uh, with their advisors has determined that a rate increase is necessary to support a bond to construct this next phase uh, I am going to begin by uh, recognizing Mr. Scott Chin. Uh, he's going to describe the uh, consent decree we have and the system of rates and charges and what it legally must do in terms of who must pay it and what it must be used for. Uh, and he will start with the slides up on the screen. With your permission, I will turn off a few lights here so we can see the screen better. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the council. My name is Scott Chin, as Mr. DeBonis said, and I'm a lawyer at the Figure Baker Daniels Law Firm. In Indianapolis uh, we serve uh, as bond counsel uh, on this project my uh, law partner Scott Peck is the lead bond counsel on the project but I'm here tonight to talk really more uh, about the legal background as Mr. DeBonis said that what, what brings us here uh, today so what you have before you and what we're projecting up on the screen is really three presentations I think it's fair to summarize them as law engineering and finance so mine is the law part and uh, I'm gonna go through that now uh, certainly uh, feel free of course uh, to ask questions but I'm going to get us uh, started by just giving you a little overview of where we're, we're going and um, I speak a little quickly and so I'll try to uh, not do that uh, tonight and try to recognize uh, you for your questions um, so Mr. DeBonis actually just told us number one what legal materials have been presented to the council in aid uh, of this uh, proposal uh, it, it's quite a bit but you'll actually uh, have even more uh, tonight through these presentations so you'll have a description of course uh, of what the system improvements are a discussion about the finance uh, issues uh, and of course uh, the rate issues uh, but in addition to that I'm going to speak a little bit more specifically about the legal piece in the, in the background but you have those things uh, already in the in the record to consult so Really, I want to answer mainly those next three questions. Why are we here? What is the council being asked to do? And what are the consequences if you don't do it? What are the consequences for the, for the city, the sanitary district, and the community from, from inaction? So why are we here, legally speaking? What's the reason uh, why uh, we are in this position to need funding for wastewater system improvements well very basically the federal clean water act and of course indiana laws uh, to regulate sewer discharges to rivers and streams the same sorts of uh, discharges that also as mr debona said can end up in you know basements of homes uh, and in other uh, uh, facilities and, and buildings in, in, in any event uh, bad things uh, that should be eliminated or reduced East Chicago's combined sewer system has for many decades of course discharged untreated sewage during rain events now this is not unique as you probably know to East Chicago uh, most large sized communities uh, in Indiana and frankly um, a lot east of the Mississippi you know have these problems of combined sewers and they're a serious problem that have existed for in some cases more than a hundred years based on the, in, the old engineering of those systems uh, the, the question really for all, all communities like East Chicago and like so many uh, around uh, the country is what do we do now what, what are the what are the system improvements that we need how are they to be paid for and how quickly can and should we do that now this is not something brand new either uh, in terms of the specific uh, requests for funding and the, and the need to make these system improvements it, it, it the genesis of uh, the the case against the East Chicago Sanitary District stems back to 2007 at least in 2007 the Indiana Department of Environmental Management the state agency sued uh, the sanitary district seeking penalties for 
and an end to these water quality violations that stem from combined sewer overflows or raw sewage you know, dumping into our river streams and unfortunately into our, our basements. Again, not something that is unique to Chicago, not something that is, that, is, that is weird. Lots and lots of those types of lawsuits or enforcement actions have been brought over many years, the last really three decades, um, by either the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, the state agency, or in some cases, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Federal Environmental uh, Protection Bureau, and, or both. So what happened as a result of that 2007 lawsuit? Well, IDEM and the Sanitary District entered into an agreed judgment or agreed order in 2007 that requires capital improvements to the system to end that water quality, those water quality violating discharges. Everybody realizes it's not something that happens at once. It's not something you can do in a very short time. It takes time. It takes phasing. It takes planning. You've heard the phrase long-term control plan. You'll hear more about that. Uh, tonight, both in our, in our subsequent two presentations. Uh, so this, as we find ourselves in 2019, is you know, midway right into um, this, this uh, action under this agreed uh, order. And, and, I, and I underline this part because, again, I want to restate it, that this is, this is sort of in no way unusual. Um, uh, most communities of Chicago size or larger are under these types of agreed orders with the state government or, again, in some cases, consent decrees. Uh, with the federal government and those orders require many things but typically they require the same types of improvements to the wastewater treatment plant to parts of the collection system or to other times other types of capital improvements or processes that need to change to eliminate or reduce the wet weather sewer discharges so in the end, so <clears throat> we have to pay for these improvements right uh, and Indiana law requires that sewer system users bear the burden uh, of those costs of the system in a just and equitable manner uh, through rates and charges. So that's true, just generally speaking, with respect to operations, right, and normal capital. Well, here is additional wet weather capital or wet weather <coughs> improvements that are occasioned as a result of this agreed order, right, that, that, we're, uh, that we're under, uh, court supervised, um, with, uh, with the state uh, IDEM. And it is uh, through that normal state law of how you pay for uh, all improvements that the rates uh, recommended uh, by the Sanitary District Board and before you tonight in the resolution are funded. It's, a, it's rates and charges on sewer users. Now, what, what do you do with those rates and charges? Well, here, the state revolving fund um, is the mechanism by which um, will be able to utilize very low cost debt, which again you'll hear more about the financial advisors at Baker Tilly, for these water sewer improvements. And, and, and that system also contemplates that system users bear the charges for paying back the debt service. In fact, that's how the bonds are structured as net revenue bonds, with user charges being paid against that debt that comes from the state revolving fund. So takes lots of cooks in this kitchen, right? It takes lots of governmental actors playing their roles in order to accomplish the important environmental remediation that comes from compliance with this agreed order that came back, that started back in 2007. So IDM, of course, enforces the Clean Water Act through that 2007 agreed order. The sanitary district is required as a signatory to it and a party to it to comply with that order implement improvements funded by bonds in this case and raise sewer rates to service the bond debt at least to recommend those sewer rate increases ultimately to this council the srf program the state agency will provide the sanitary district low interest loans to reduce the cost of those improvements so it's a very responsible way to borrow the money and in fact that's why that program exists right for indiana municipalities to be able to take advantage of low interest rate loans for sewer and water and then finally, but importantly, the council approves the sewer rates that the sanitary district needs in order uh, to service that debt to accomplish those improvements. Th those are the, the entities that are involved here. So what's the council being asked to do um, in, in terms of playing uh, its part? Well, actually, the request of the council is rather narrow, but, but very important. So the council isn't being asked to, to approve the bonds. Under the law, that's a function. 
uh, for the sanitary district. The council isn't being asked to approve specific projects under these phase two improvements that you'll hear more specifics about. In other words, what are these improvements? What's, what's being done at the waste our treatment plant? What's being done in the collection system? What's being done in terms of holding uh, effluent? Um, the council is being asked to approve new rates that will permit the funding of those improvements that are required under the 2007 agreed order. That's the way the law works. The, law, the way the law works is sanitary district decides what the improvement should be, reasonably figures out a funding mechanism, like in this case SRF funding, approves the bonds, recommends the rate increases calculated to service the debt on those bonds, right, and then puts it before the council as the fiscal body in order to establish those, those rates. So absent the council approval, this is the important part, right, absent council approval, the sanitary district can't move forward uh, with the improvements. Uh, because it won't have the funding uh, to do so. So if that were to happen, what are the consequences? What are the consequences of inaction? Well, first, as I just said, n no raise in, in, in rate, uh, rates, uh, no money to be able to pay the debt, and therefore uh, it's impossible to move forward with the phase two improvements to satisfy the long-term control plan. Second, the sanitary district would then risk being in breach of the agreed order, that 2007 agreed order that we've talked about that is a legally compliant, uh, compliance requ requiring document, which could make it liable for, for so-called stipulated fines and penalties. There are fines and penalties embedded actually in the agreed order if the sanitary district doesn't make good on its commitments to improve water quality um, on a timely basis under the order. I would note here, uh, and again, this is not something uh, uncommon. This is really something that's in all of these environmental agreed orders and consent decrees. There's a, there's a specific provision of the 2007 agreed order that contains a funding provision that says, hey, look, tr try to do things like get low interest loans, right, from state programs and that sort of thing, um, and, and, and that's just fine. Uh, we, there's, no, there's no reason not to do that. but. Ultimately, the responsibility for funding the obligations of the agreed order are on local government. Uh, a failure of funding will invite an action by IDEM potentially against the council. You're, you, now, the city and the council are not parties, right, to the 2007 agreed order. The question is, would, the, would IDEM seek to bring in the city or the council for that funding purpose if you, if you don't pass uh, the, the, the rates? That has happened in other communities and um, it is possible here. Number three, the sanitary district could be liable for water quality violations. So it's, it's, it's it one, one obligation, right, of course, the sanitary district has is to make good on its obligations under this agreed order, right, by making these system improvements that you're, you'll hear more about. But the other obligation that it has is just to make sure that it is as little as possible discharges, you know, water quality violating water in uh, uh, combined sewer um, uh, effluent into river streams and, and, and basements. So you've got sort of a double whammy. You've got the, the fact of not being in compliance with the order, potentially causing fines and penalties, and the fact of just ongoing violations, which could be brought in a new lawsuit in the future. There's also a little bit of an opportunity cost on the funding issue. So of course, um, you'll hear about these attractive rates and the way that the, this financing has been built through the SRF program that we've uh, talked about, uh, and the sanitary district could lose that SRF funding or at least potentially pay a higher interest rate in the future if there's a delay uh, in, the, in the passage of the program. And then, of course, the reason for the agreed order to begin with, right, is positive environmental impact. So what you lose in any delay is the po positive environmental impacts of addressing the sewer discharges here through this second phase of the long-term control plan compliance. So just to recap, and, and certainly be available for any of your questions, uh, to be in compliance with the 2007 agreed order, the sanitary district must implement these phase two improvements to the wastewater treatment plant and sewer collection system, as the case may be. The sanitary district has determined the amount needed for those phase two funding and passed a bond resolution and a rate modification to service the debt on those bonds. So the council is, is, is being asked, respectfully, to approve the new rates that will permit those phase two improvements to go forward, sort of for all the reasons that I, I've suggested, and to avoid uh, the consequences of inaction. So we'd be happy to answer any questions, and of course, again, you'll have both engineering uh, and finance presentations behind 
behind me. Any questions for the attorney? Councilwoman Orange? Uh, I have a couple questions. So the bond uh, <clears throat> issuance, what is the rate on that bond? So I think it's I think it's two 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 percent, right? Yeah, so the, it's two percent for these FR, SRF bonds. And so why couldn't the city use uh, casino money to cover this debt? Right. So what the what the statute, the state statute, and the way in which these bonds are set up contemplate is user charges. So the idea is it's users. Now in reality, it was it was policymakers and users from a long time ago, right, that created the sewer system that overflows in the ways that are, that are violative. But it's, it's users of the system, right, that cause or contribute to the discharges. So it's users that should pay, under the legal theory and the state statute, for all of the operation, maintenance, capital improvements, including these wet weather capital improvements for the system. If you divert and use other types of funds, it's just simply inconsistent with the, the law uh, that that um, governs how sewer rates and charges are supposed to be raised for for the system itself. I, I should tell you um, that also is not a really good question, and it's something that is raised in other communities. Right? Some every community is a little different, and some have different types of funds potentially available for these sorts of things. Right? Uh, but in but in all cases that I'm aware of, at least, and I've been involved in at least four other communities with their consent decrees or agreed orders and addressing these these water quality violations through these things. Um, in all cases that I'm aware of, it's sewer user fees, right, that are raised um, to address uh, the financing or to service the debt uh, for that. Councilman Perez. Mr. Chen, um, you're not trying to tell us, are you, that casino money can't be used? I heard you say typically, you know, uh, they're done by user rates. Uh, the law contemplated uh, a different approach. But are you saying that we cannot use casino money to do this project? What I'm saying is that I think two, two, maybe two things, uh, Counselor. Uh, first, I certainly haven't seen it done, and so I certainly wouldn't be able to venture in a, a legal opinion that under the circumstances of, the, of this agreed order and this funding mechanism, the casino money would be legally appropriate to use. I, I can't flatly tell you it's, it's legally impossible. I won't, I won't go that far. Uh, I haven't seen it done, and I, I'm, I'm not sure that, that, it, that it's lawful. What I do know um, is that um, Again, all, all the communities in Indiana, and again, you'll hear, I think you'll see a comparison of communities and their rates that would, when they're involved in, in some of these um, wet, wet weather remediation efforts throughout the state. All communities that I'm aware of have relied on sewer rates and charges, because, again, because of the sort of theory that it's the system users, right, that are sort of re responsible and not other people who contributed other pots of money to, to a city. So I, 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 that is, to me, the sort of better legal answer. The entire amount of money that you're requesting is for infrastructure? Yeah, you're going to hear, it's, it's, I think the amount, it's $7.75 .75 million or so. You're going to hear more specifics on this, so please uh, don't quote me, quote uh, the in engineers and finance folks, but uh, there's a list of the actual system improvements in Mayor Copeland's letter uh, to you, I think, of November 15th. So literally, they're, they're, I think all those things are sort of capital projects. But you're going to hear more specifically detail about those things here tonight uh, that, that make up that $7 million plus of financing. Councilman Garcia? Yes. Uh, how many phases, uh, phases are there? Well, I think there are th three phases. Um, yeah. uh, that, again, you can you'll you'll hear more about, but I think we're talking about phase two of three phases. So, okay, phase two. How much are you plan uh, is is going to cost for phase two? So the the ask for for this phase two is again, I think the, um, the I think the estimate the amount of the bonds is it's seven million dollars plus, so it's seven point seven five million dollars. I think is the is the anticipated amount again I'll apologize and be corrected if it's a little different than that right. when you hear from the finance folks phase three how much is phase three oh plus five yeah that's right so the 7.75 or let's call it seven plus you know forgive me let's call it seven plus right with respect to this that's that's new that's new borrowing under this SRF low interest loan program there's an, an already existing five million dollars that exists that doesn't have to be re, you know raised that already exists so it's five plus the seven plus if you will so seven 
Seven, seven new. Seven okay. Yes, seven seven point seven five new money. Okay. How about uh, phase three? What's phase three? I'll, again, I'll have to defer. Hey, Councillor, are you finished, sir? Are you finished with your presentation? I am. So then maybe we can move well, on. Well, that's the right. So I, I, we're just going to go back and forth if you can't answer. So yes. No, no, I'm sorry. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm the law guy. We have engineering and finance. No, I'm just folks. saying if you're done with that's your I am. Question. Yeah. We, yes. Okay, go ahead. You go said, ahead. like, in theory, that's how things are paid for. In theory, we have a surplus, and we don't want to put that burden on the residents. Um, I think that's something that should have been um, looked at um, through the law, uh, and that, that's another option. I think we all agree um, that needs to be done. You know, it's just how this is going to get paid. Um, in theory, we don't want to put no burden on the residents. So I think that's something you need to, to look up. Because um, um, you said funding falls on the local government. You know what, local government, if the local government has got a surplus, why not pay for it, not put it on the burden of the residents? Um, on the rates and charges under the IC code 36-9-25-11, does it, what, does it clearly state um, that we don't have, if we have a surplus, we can't use our surplus? It, it does. So, that, so if you look at 36-9-25-11, um, subsection A, um, yeah, it's Exhibit Three of the of the original documents that you had submitted by the by the administration. So that's that's subsection uh, A. Uh, the, the the phrase that I used um, on the PowerPoint um, was uh, drawn from this subsection. It says the fees must be just and equitable and to be paid by any user of the sewage sewage works. Uh, and, and then it goes through, you know, who those uh, users are. Of course, it gives the power to the board to change those fees from time to time. Uh, there's also a federal regulation, because again, here we're talking about here is the Clean Water Act. So there's a federal regulation that is with those uh, materials as well that talks about when you have a user charge system, which obviously we do. I, again, as most communities, not, not unique to East Chicago and other communities um, have surpluses too sometimes in other accounts. Nonetheless, the federal regulations also suggest that the user charge system uh, must be designed to produce adequate revenues, designed for the operation and maintenance, including replacement. Uh, and, and, and including addressing these these point source pollution discharges. So even in this case where we're talking about wet weather remediation, it's the users of the system that, that, that bear the burden in our system. Councilwoman Orange. Mr. Chairman, your opinion on this? Uh, I have a law question for Attorney Chen. How are you, Scott? I'm good, thank you. Great. And this is a law question, Mr. President. Was covered in the law section. It's a follow up to the issue raised by Councilman Perez and by Councilman Garcia. Uh, can you swing back, Scott, to uh, your uh, slide that has number two at the top? Oh, yeah. Just one quick second, please. I know we advanced. It. No, that's okay. And we want to move forward. But the council members have raised a legitimate legal question that should, if we can resolve it, should be resolved. Now, at this point, <coughs> okay, I'm sorry, which slide? Number two. Okay, so there we go. One that has no oh. number two at the top. Got it. Uh, the page, there are two pages of this, so there's that one. And this one. Uh, the second page. Okay, got it. The very top bullet. Yes. Point, number six. Yes. Indiana law, the key word is in your slide that I want to focus on is requires that sewer system users bear the burden of the cost of the system improvements. In, in a just and equitable manner. Yeah. I want to focus on 36-9-25-11A right. that you just pointed out to the council in response to some of the questions posed by Councilman Perez and by Councilman Garcia. Uh, you, we know, as you've indicated, that the custom and practice you're used to in the projects you've worked on thus far is typically the needed improvements are financed by increases in user fees. But do you agree, as a matter of law, that A reads, in connection with its duties, and that would be the sanitary district's duties to make any needed improvements, 
that the sanitary district board and the council, the word is may. It says mm -hmm. may fix sewer fees. It's not a shell. Would you agree it's not a shell? I agree with that. It's a may. That's right. So if they may fix user rates to finance it, that would be one financing option for the need to improve it. Agreed. Uh, and uh, if there are other financing options, we don't know uh, at this stage whether there are, but there's been discussion of other financing options. It's true that the sanitary district could meet its duties to finance needed improvements to stay in compliance with the agreed order if they had other legally available funds, correct? Well, assuming that those legal available funds were able to be legally used, exactly right, for, for these, so it's not just the, their availability, but it's the suitability, the legal yeah. suitability for use of those funds for this particular purpose. Well, ultimately, the council would decide what's suitable among legal challenges, right? Well, assuming, again, assuming that the funds, you know, X funds um, in, in a city fund are themselves, under their governing laws, able to be used for Absolutely. that purpose. So that's what I mean by legally suitable. Where your uh, bullet point six says Indiana law requires that it be sewer user rates, 36.9.25.11 says in fulfilling duties to make improvements, the sanitary district and council may impose increases in user rates. They could use other legally suitable and available funds if they're available, correct? Uh, assuming. Yes, assuming that those funds are appropriate for legally available and appropriate for use for that for that purpose. That was the point that uh, Councilman Perez and Councilman Garcia wanted to clarify. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the attorney uh, on the law side? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce to you uh, Mr. Matt Spidell of Butler Fairman, who's going to address uh, what it is we're building. Good evening. Matt Spidell, Butler Fairman and Cypher, uh, project manager for engineering. Okay. Um, to answer, I, I believe, a question during the last presentation on phase three. Um, Phase three has not been designed. Uh, it must be completed by um, the year 2032. Um, the long-term control plan that outlines the scope of phase three uh, at this time we believe is underestimated what's in that document and needs to be revisited. So to answer your question, I, I really don't have an answer on how much phase three is other than we know it has to be completed by 2032 and needs to be uh, scoped completely and engineered. Councilman Garcia? Yeah, since you say that, um, excuse me, is phase three going to start right after phase two or? It, uh, the design should, in our opinion. Um, there is a schedule in the long-term control plan. Uh, the district is actually behind on that schedule. We're in the process of negotiating with the IDEM on what a realistic schedule is. Uh, but it is our understanding that 2032 is pretty much a drop dead date for the IDEM and your agreed order. They don't like that date to move. So 2032. Uh, if I may interrupt. Can you approach, please? We've already advised IDEM that from what we know now, phase three could not start before 2025. And it may start after that. So uh, my question is phase three has got to be done by 2032. Correct. That is correct. Okay. That's it, Mr. President. Yes. Councilwoman Orange. Well, then what happens if it's not? Um, I would defer to Mr. DeBonis, but... Um, what happens if it's not finished? <coughs> yes. We're either going to... Yeah, that's what I said. you got to step up, attorney, because we can't, uh, can't hear you. It's really, I've not made myself heard, but I do know that you want to be on the record. Um, I think... I'll, I'll defer to Mr. Chen, but one or two things will happen. We'll pay a lot of fines and civil penalties, um, or uh, we will be allowed more time to finish it. Uh, it's a dangerous thing to rely on the uh, largesse of the government, especially years from now. So um, 
we plan to bring projects in on time when we can. Councilman Garcia? Yes. Um, I said there, you said there was an issue with phase three. What's the, what's the issue with phase three that um, you need an extension on it? So, we're, so we are behind on this actual schedule uh, for phase two. Uh, phase three has not, design has not started. Uh, Butler Fairman and Cypher was not uh, the district's engineer for the actual long-term control plan. So we're not familiar with phase three. Uh, our recommendation would be that you uh, that the district uh, contract with an engineer, whether it be Butler Fairman and Cypher or another, uh, to work through phase three to get it to a point where it can go to construction. Maybe I will clear, uh, I clarify more. Phase three cannot start unless we finish phase two, because this is just disinfection, which it should be sent out to the water in case we have more than 10 years rain events. This is it. I had a question just with the phase two. I know uh, Attorney Chin said that it would stop the basements from flooding. Now, would it stop it with phase two, or are we going to have to wait till phase three? Can you? Sure. Phase two will eliminate any event that is uh, in a 10 years uh, rain events for one hour. So anything that is, as you know, uh, for a time series of a rain, if a rain repeats itself every year is, is banal. The more you go for years to come, for example, you say this rain didn't come until this is five years more. So. Once it's repeated for long years, it becomes very frequent and very, very dangerous. For us, we can, with this project, any rain event that is 10 years, one hour, it will be uh, eliminated by the system. We will be good. Even for 50 or 100 years, no one can reach it. We, we hope we don't go that phase. So, but for our case, we are obliged by IDM and it should be presented that we have to comply with CSO event for 10 years and one hour event. Okay, but can you just, yes or no, will, it, will the basement flood? Will my no. basement flood again? We're not, right now they are not uh, flooding. So because we are doing uh, much okay. more. Okay, I'm on my third <laughs> remodel. Okay. And you can ask the people in my district, we, we're, every, hey, we're shaking every time it rains. No, because, because we're, you, we're you know why? Flooded. Because you know why? So, because we have you know. combined system. Right now we are doing cleaning, 25% for this. I've heard it all, Doc. So I just okay. want to know if so it's going to fix it or there not. Is no, there, there is no floods if we do it on time. Okay. Thanks. I want to clarify the term flooding. Lake Michigan is up four plus feet. We're getting a lot of groundwater. A lot of the calls that I've had and received and inspected are not sewage problems. They're okay. groundwater. Well, so I'll, I'll let's make clarify. Sure you come to my house when you see uh, feces <laughs> that, that's, flowing that's in. That's different. When you got so baby roofs floating I'll, around, I'll, I'll, that's different. You. I'm talking about when you don't have any baby roofs. We're getting a lot of groundwater. I just wanted to define flooding. This ain't groundwater. So <laughs> okay. I'll define it. All right. Councilman Medina. Councilman Francisco, didn't we, we or the sanitation district, didn't they address the problems that we had in Roxana? I believe at one time they put one sewer, they took it out of the parkway and put it into the street, but that didn't solve anything. And, and I ask you this because I believe we, we've addressed this a few times, and uh, I, I'm not sure what uh, projects they, they did actually do to help prevent the flooding. I don't, I don't think that uh, we could prevent Mother Nature from doing anything. Right. Uh, anything short of the uh, the black flow to the sewers, the, the, the check valve, am I correct? correct? Correct. I know they were all offering a program where the, the city pays half for the check valve. Have, have the residents of Roxana taken advantage of Some that? Some of them and has. And has that worked for them? Uh, I believe so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Councilman Garcia? Yeah, um, phase one was completed, correct? Yes. How much did that cost? Six, six, six and a half, seven million dollars, um, approximately. Do you anticipate uh, phase three to be more? Uh, honestly, I, we have not um, evaluated phase three. 
Um, phase three includes sewer Doctor, separation. You got to come to the podium. We can't hear you. You got to come up if you want to talk. Phase three includes sewer separation projects as well as disinfection at the wastewater treatment plant. Yes, sir. Any other questions? You have anything else to run? Hashem. Good. How are you? Uh, is the primary function of phase two to reduce or, if possible, eliminate combined soil overflows into the Grand Calumet River and the Indian Harbor Ship Canal? That is correct. Um, so this is that the central focus of this phase? Yes, it is. So at the wastewater treatment plant, I don't mean to cut you off, there, there is a combined sewer overflow lagoon. Um, what this project is doing is sending wet weather flow when the system can't keep up to that lagoon where it's stored until that wet weather um, storm event subsides and the wastewater treatment plant can catch back up to treat the sewage before it is discharged into the Grand, Grand Cal and Indiana Harbor. In response to the question raised by Council President, can't represent to the public, can we, that basement sewage overflows will be eliminated by this phase? I would, I would agree with that statement. Any other questions? Next. <coughs> sure. Um, so uh, just to go through uh, what we're doing, as I indicated, the CSL lagoon uh, at the wastewater treatment plant uh, is storing uh, that excess amount of flow during wet weather. Um, we're going to be completing piping uh, to get to that lagoon, and we're, we're also including flow meters uh, in order to do post monitoring to ensure that the project's doing what we said it would and to uh, further refine scope of phase three. Um, so Alder Street, uh, 33 million gallons per day capacity, uh, replacing three existing pumps um, with pumps that are rated uh, with a higher uh, head capacity in order to get that additional flow to the wastewater treatment plant lagoon. Uh, new controls for these pumps. Um, Roxana, six million gallon per day pumping capacity, uh, replacing again two pumps uh, to get additional sewage to the CSO lagoon and installing a backup generator uh, and 152nd Street. This is the force main sewer uh, that finishes the connection to the lagoon. Uh, Wastewater treatment plant at the lagoon. Um, again, we're going to be installing a flow meter uh, to evaluate uh, flow to the lagoon. Um, and uh, at, at the lagoon itself, we're actually making some repairs to the influent where it flows into the lagoon. And then 145th Street. 145th Street is a stormwater lift station. Uh, the, the reason this is part of this project is we are sending stormwater directly uh, to the Grand Calumet and keeping it out of your combined sewer system. Um, why are we going to do it? Uh, because our children deserve the best we can give them, including a cleaner Grand Cal. Uh, dependable water wastewater system is the foundation of a successful community and uh, to follow up on the previous presentation because we agreed to do it uh, in the long-term control plan uh, and agreed orders. Uh, entertain any further questions? Councilman Garcia? Yes. Uh, are you going to have backup generators at those locations when the power goes out in the storm or whatever? Right. So Roxana <coughs> will, will have a new backup generator, uh, permanent backup generator. Uh, Alder Street currently has one. Uh, 145th Street, I believe, backup generator would be provided by a portable generator that uh, crews would actually have to go and take out there. Okay. Uh, when they have to overflow it, um, where is it going to not in the Roxana part of um, 
of the Grand Calumet? Where in the Grand Calumet is it flowing to? So uh, currently, um, it actually um, overflows out of the lagoon if there's too much flow. Uh, there's also an outlet into Indiana Harbor and Michigan Avenue is the third one. There are three points. On oh, Dickey Road? The Alder Street pump station currently outlets out at Klein Avenue to the Grand Cal, and then the Michigan Avenue pump station goes to the Indiana Harbor Ship Canal. So you guys have three outfalls in your system. So, that's all, Mr. President. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council, uh, President, Clerk. My name is Andre Riley. I'm a principal or director, formerly a principal under Umball and now a director under Baker Tilly. We are the financial advisor, municipal advisors to the Sanitary District. My partner here, Eric, uh, is also with Baker Tilly. He will talk about the financing, where I'll talk about the rates and charges or the financing plan. Excuse me. So. In your packets, I believe there were two documents. One is the PowerPoint presentation, and then there's a 35-page accounting report. I will not go through the accounting report, but this accounting report is summarized in the PowerPoint presentation. Sorry about that, Council. So in the financing plan, I'll talk about the, uh, kind of go through these steps. What is the objectives of the financing plan or the cost service study that leads into financing the proposed bonds? The historical trends for the sanitary district. Also the revenue requirements, let's call the revenue requirements the budget, what it costs to operate the system on a day-to-day -day basis and make those improvements those end-of-life capital assets that need to replace, be replaced over time to continue to provide services to the customers in the community. The drivers of the revenues needed, so you have the revenue requirements, the budget, the revenues that support that, and any shortfalls or overages would be those additional revenues. User rate comparisons, comparing uh, East Chicago to other communities throughout the state. The bond financing with Eric Walsh will talk about the SRF loan. Um, and the structure of that. And then the long-term control plan comparisons. As Scott Chin and others had mentioned prior, there's other communities throughout the Midwest and in Indiana um, and nationwide, quite frankly, that deal with these same issues. The objectives. So the pink ele elephant in the room is obviously the mandate. So the objective of the cost of service study is how to fund that unfunded mandate from IDEM and who oversees IDEM is EPA, that consent decree from 2007, which Mr. Chin spoke about earlier. That's phase two of the project that's scheduled to go through 2021. <coughs> the build revenues, so to support those operations or that budget, you need the build revenues. What we've noticed over time, there's been a decline in usage or the revenues that from prior adjustments and rates have not materialized. Also the operating expenses to keep up with costs, power, electric, gas, uh, to continue to make repairs and maintenance and also uh, continue to uh, strengthen the staffing of the sanitary district. Uh, because part of the long-term control plan is you also have to maintain and operate the system on a day-to-day -day basis. And also, as I spoke to earlier, the annual capital improvements, those pay-as-you-go uh, projects that aren't quite big enough to fit into a bond financing, they are paid through rates and charges. Those are like vehicles, rolling stock, uh, other equipment, things of that nature. From a historical trends perspective, I've listed out the last five years of the cash balances of the utility. 
And the 2015 bond, which is the 5.2 million that's available to, to spend down on, on this phase two um, project is a rated bond. And part of S&P's rating is based on your, your day's cash on hand. And that's for a utility to this size, it's about $1 million to $5 million. And as you can see, that trend, uh, the cash balance in, of the history, it's been pretty sufficient. It's right in the middle. So to continue to have those strong cash balances, do all those things that I spoke about earlier, the rates need to be adjusted to continue to maintain that rating. And, and quite honestly, the rating went up this year. Uh, it went from an A minus to A based on the cash reserves and the strengthening uh, of the city and the, and the sanitary district. As I talk about the revenue requirements of the budget to operate the system, what we've proposed for the uh, financing plan is a three-phase uh, increase, um, and that fits with the project and also bridges the gap to whenever phase three would happen sometime in the future. And so pretty much the first six lines down to replacements and improvements, that is the budget. So we have operation and maintenance, the outstanding debt service on the 2015 loan, the proposed, the proposed debt service and reserve on the uh, proposed bond, and the payment in lieu of tax and the replacements and improvements. As you can see, the total revenue requirements is about 8.2, 8.7, and $9, $9 million a year. Mr. President. Could I just point something out, Andre? Yeah. Um, you're using the term phase, and we just spent a half hour talking about phases of the long-term control plan. Those are different terms, right? Yes. Yeah, so the phases in the long-term con control plan are about the capital uh, dollar spent or the staging with EPA and IDEM. So this is just phases. This is the, rates. the rate phasing of the rates. So the so the ordinance you have in front of you is proposed to have three rate phases or increases or adjustments. And those are what I'm speaking to when I talk about the budget, the revenues, and then whatever shortfall to make up uh, to fund the budget. So those additional revenues required 1.3 million, 500,000, and 200, or almost 300,000. Those are the adjustments that needed to come from all your customers in the system, residential, commercial, industrial. And also, as Mr. Chin spoke to earlier, a state statute that rates must be equitable and just. And through a cost service study, those principles allow the rates to be equitable and just, where you allocate the cost based on those users who use the system. So typically, in most systems we see, industrial customers are usually cheaper to serve because they have ratable flow. It's coming constant. Where residential customers, they have peaks, typically in the, in the morning and at night. So those customers are usually more expensive to serve. And what you'll see, most of these improvements are flow-based. So we've allocated the cost proportionally to who's using the system. And then uh, from a cost service study, not every customer gets the same percentage increase. Some increases are higher than others, but from a dollar perspective, you're generating those dollars from the people that are using the system the most. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think this will actually help. Um, I think that you're proposing $550,000 in debt service and reserve requirement for the new long-term control plan. Yes, I'll get to that on the next $2 slide. $2 million in new revenue. So yeah. it might be helpful to point out to the council, um, not all of the new money is needed just for the long-term control plan. So some of the new revenue that's being proposed is for built-in increases in expenses for the sanitary district. Only 500 to 550,000 of the new money is being used for the uh, long-term control plan. As Councilman Perez asked the question about what's making up that rate, uh, thank you. This slide kind of breaks that down. So of the $2.1 million of additional revenues needed, so as I spoke to you about, this is over three years. So the operation and maintenance expense includes in inflation to take care of any increases in power, repairs and maintenance, continues strengthening the staff of the utility. Um, any unforeseen items that may come up 
from an operational day-to-day -day expense standpoint. The revenue shortfall, the, uh, the rate fatigue I spoke to, um, that's because as we look back, I think over about a five-year period, we noticed there's been an attrition in revenues, also a little bit of decline in customer base. So typically, you'd want to recover those revenues that are lost. Um, so you're not adjusting revenues or, or rates without taking into account any attrition in revenues. Payment in lieu of tax, the debt service and debt service reserve, the rate funded capital that's in the life pay as you go assets, and then the, uh, the rate fatigue also. Councilwoman Orange. So the uh, pay in lieu of tax, who would be, who would qualify for such a service? The payment in lieu of tax is a statutory requirement within the code that allows the budget that I spoke to, that those dollars flow uh, typically from utilities that are municipally owned, they flow from uh, the utility over to the general fund because they don't pay tax. If, like from the water department. Yeah, so in some places there's an investor-owned utility. They would pay tax like Indian American citizens, other places like that throughout the state. They pay tax to the local units. In this case, there is no taxes on those assets that are in the ground or above ground. So they're paying a payment in lieu of tax. Councilman Perez. It's questions for Steve. <clears throat> I want to make sure I got this right. Okay. You said that out of the total amount that they're asking for, the seven plus million. Yeah. Did I understand this right? Only five hundred and fifty thousand is what's needed for the long term. No, plan. I, I probably misspoke. They do need to borrow, or not, actually, they have to do thirteen million dollars in work, and they're going to use a bunch of their cash. So they only need to borrow seven point seven five million dollars. That's true. To borrow that $7.75 million, they need $550,000 a year in debt service payments. So I, I said it in such a way that I confused you. I apologize. So, so it's just, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me. So counsel. our payment towards that debt yes. would be $550,000. Yes. So we could theoretically, getting back to my casino revenue, we could do a interest-free loan to the sanitary district. And have them pay back that loan to five hundred fifty thousand. You have at least two attorneys here who are going to disagree on the answer on that question, but I, I would say yes because I'm not one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Over how many years do we have to pay that? Over how many years? So, so, so my my colleague Eric Walsh will talk more about the financing, but in most cases, SRF is over 20 years. These projects, the useful life, I'll let the engineers get into the gory details, but SRF has a typical anything less than 50-year life on those assets, usually has a 20-year financing. It's just about spreading those costs over the users, the user base as it exists, and just how does that asset match up with the financing. So uh, it's 20 years at 2%. It's level debt, so like your home mortgage where you're paying Five hundred, a thousand dollars a month. It's pretty consistent throughout the term. My, my colleague will speak to that. And also, there's a debt service reserve. I'm sorry, I didn't really speak to that. Can you have Garcia, excuse me, yes, Garcia, go ahead. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. President. Yeah, can you explain the difference between revenue shortfall and prior rates and rate fatigue? So, um, and I broke this out a little bit. So, the revenue shortfall and prior rates. So. Uh, in 2016, there was a two-phase rate increase, and we expected revenues to be X. But those revenues didn't produce. So to continue the financing plan, we're trying to recapture those lost revenues from various classes of customers, and that's where the prior revenues are that shortfall. So that's normal. Um, not every, uh, I'd say, uh, rate adjustment includes that, but I think that's uh, wise to take that into consideration, especially when you have declining usage, which means your revenues decline or you have attrition or a decrease in customer base. But you still have those same assets that need to be covered okay, I got in that. operations. How about rate fatigue? So the rate fatigue is taken into consideration the future rate, rate adjustments that are proposed that you consider for first reading. So considering there's going to be a little bit of fatigue in those as you increase rates, the same people that weren't paying before more than likely will not pay again. So you're adjusting 
for that for that fact. Right. And the reason I bring that up, it, it, you say, as you said, is declining usage. Mm -hmm. um, East Chicago was shrinking. Um, thus population that we have. That's why you've seen that decline. That's why um, you didn't see that increase in, uh, in revenue. Um, and as as I see, if we decline in usage, rates are going to go higher, correct? There's a lot of factors in that. Um, if, if you give me an exact example, I could probably speak oh, to it, but it's not use, always a dollar for dollar a decline, situation. Decline uh, of usage, you know. So you need to pay. You need to pay the bill somehow. So that means the rate has going to, have to go up even more. In this case, we're mm -hmm. taking that in consideration. Also, typically, in a, and I'll defer to the engineers. When you have combined sewers, you're not only taking that sewage, but also rainwater that is not produced by those customers. But everybody has to share in treating those costs: mm -hmm. industrial, commercial, residential. So. Any other questions? Um, I think this is always a good um, illustration to show different communities as they face different uh, challenges, whether that be long-term control plan or other items that may come up. Because IDEM and the EPA, there's always regulations rolling through uh, right now. A lot of communities are dealing with phosphorus. I believe Dr. Z could speak to that. Um, East Chicago is ahead of the game on that, but there will be ammonia coming and other regulations that are coming from IDEM that all communities throughout Indiana will have to face. So uh, just looking at 25,000 and above, so that's kind of, let's say that's the uh, user group or the, uh, the group that may, most reflects East Chicago. So you can see um, most of those communities, 25,000 and above, for 5,000 gallons or above, even where phase three is going to be. And I know many of these communities are dealing with, and we'll get into that, long-term control plans or other improvements that need to be done. And so you can see where a lot of those rates are pretty recent, but there will be increases coming from other communities um, in the future. So. Baker Tilly, um, informally Umball, <coughs> for many years has done a biennial rate study where we sample water, sewer, storm water, where we look at a large sample size of communities. I think this is a good illustration uh, to kind of benchmark uh, East Chicago, where their current rate is for 5,000 gallons is $20.60. Phase one gets it up to 28.41. But when you look at the population of 25,000 and over, and then the statewide average, there's still a pretty big gap there. Um, and that's for 390 communities throughout Indiana. Again, the, these next three slides kind of discuss, well, from an industrial standpoint, what the cost of service study really, uh, what materializes through a cost of service study. <clears throat> So a lot of these industrial customers, they have other things than just build revenue, which is your, tor your typical monthly uh, billing and collection. They also have monitoring that they do because they're in, uh, regulated by EPA for industrial discharge, and they also have excessive strength surcharges. So not necessarily the user charge that is the monthly recurring charges because monitoring doesn't happen every month and uh, excessive strength sur surcharges don't happen every month. But you can see for a large section of the group, their, their uh, increases are growing or, or, or more than likely going up. So on the average, it's about 10%. Um, some, some percentages are higher, some are lower. And what we try to do in a cost service study is tip, if we're going to phase it in, that first phase is a cost of service study where we're allocating costs to the various users. And then phases two and three are across the board. And that's just kind of setting the deck and then the phase in rates to ease the burden on different rate payers. We, we come in with an across the board approach. I will turn it over to my colleague, Eric Walsh. Thank you, Andre. 
Eric Walsh, a partner with uh, Baker Tilly Municipal Advisors. I'm going to be very brief and go through a couple of slides relating to the financing. <clears throat> We've already hit on a lot of these points tonight, but what you'll see on the screen is the top third is the construction related <coughs> costs, about $12.2 million. <coughs> the middle of the page is non construction, that's things like your legal fees, uh, engineering related to getting the bonds issued, et cetera. A little over 700000 comes to a total project of approximately $13 million. As several of you have asked tonight, what is this phase really costing us? Phase true two is truly costing $13 million. The financing from that is coming from really two places, though. There's $5.2 million left over from the previous round of financing that we did a few years ago with phase one that's going to be used now uh, from cash on hand that's still sitting there in the, in the sanitary district's coffers. The second piece to fund the difference is the $7.75 million bond issue for the borrowing from the state revolving fund. I know there's a lot of numbers on this page and it's hard to see, so I'll really just kind of pull you to the main points. This is the proposed amortization schedule, so the repayment of that debt. Uh, as was already mentioned, 2% is the interest rate getting for, we are getting from the state revolving fund. That results in annual payments over on the far right-hand column of about $475,000 per year. Why does that not match Andre's number from a little bit earlier in slides? Because there's also debt service reserve that you guys have to accumulate and hold, or the district has to accumulate and hold for the life of those bonds. You have to fund that over the first five years. has to be baked into your revenue requirements. A couple of questions that I, I think have already been asked or at least alluded to. One, the phasing in of the rates, where we have a three-phase rate increase. Obviously, phase one is the larger uh, chunk of that, and then we have two smaller phases on the back end. The way we're getting to that with structuring the bonds is we're paying no principal payments during construction for about the first year plus. There'll be no principal paid on these bonds. That allows us not to have to finance that piece as we bake in kind of the, the, the future coverage or repayment of that bond issue. As we get into 2021, that's when the full debt or the full bond payment kicks in for this proposed uh, amortization. <clears throat> We're using that as a mechanism to be able to do that phasing in approach with the rates. The second question many have asked is what's the interest rate, what's the impact, et cetera. 2% is a subsidized interest rate, comes from federal funding through the state revolving fund and then goes out to communities such as yours that qualify for it. The funding round that you are in or the East Chicago is in is to use the money that's been allocated to you, the $7.75 million, you had from July 1st of this year to the end of March of 2020 to use those funds. Come March of 2020, if those funds aren't used, SRF then reserves the right to take that money and lend to other users that maybe didn't qualify as high uh, on the original priority list ranking. That does not take into account the IDEM requirements and the timing there. I'm speaking strictly from the financing timeline. Um, one point that I'll make is if, if the 2%, just to compare it kind of to competitive open market interest rates, let's say you said, let's not use SRF, let's delay this, let's, let's kick the can down the road. There's no guarantee SRF finance is going gonna, is gonna to be there again. But for every 100 basis points, so that's going from 2 to 3%, that's about $50,000 a year additional interest costs that you're going to pay. The sanitary district issued uh, bonds back in late 2015. The interest rate on those was about 3.5%. You had it ranging from 3 to 4%. Interest rate market's pretty similar to what it was back then. You'd probably be coming in somewhere in that range if you went to the open market. So that's about uh, $75,000 a year in interest you're saving going through the state revolving fund. Another question that you may be asking is how likely would we be to get state revolving fund to subsidize 2% money in the future? For this funding round that I talked about, July 1, 2019 through March of 2020, for your size of community, there was 19 communities that submitted an application to SRF, 11 qualified, you guys scored, or the sanitary district scored number nine. So had you scored two places, or three places worse, you would not have got the financing here. I can't tell you who's gonna apply in future years and how much financing is gonna be available. That at least gives you a background. It's not a guarantee you'll get the 2% a, a date certain in the future. The last page that I'll go through, this is really just a snapshot of the outstanding debt of the sanitary district, all paid by the user fees. So you have the 2015 bonds, that was phase one we talked about. There's some money left over from those that's going to be used for phase two. 
Those bonds pay off in 2035. As I mentioned earlier, the uh, interest rates on those range from 3 to 4%. And then the new bonds are structured in the second column, about $475,000 per year after the first two years uh, of phase-in. So you're looking at an annual revenue requirement in the, in the most uh, uh, level structured years of just over $1.4 million per year altogether. Councilman Garcia. Yeah, on this other page here, on the schedule of amortization of seven million and seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, the proposed yes. sewage work revenue bond of twenty nineteen, uh, all the way in a bond year. That's what we're paying four hundred and twenty-four thousand dollars, five hundred ninety. Are you asking the 424? Is that the annual? That's the annual. It gets paid uh, semi annually. You have semi two payments a year. That's the total annual payment, though, okay. is the 424. And then the next year, it kicks up to the 475 for the rest of the time. Okay, then uh, in 2020, July, it kicks up to a million dollars. And then semi, semi annually also? or Are you talking about this slide now? Or the next one? Yes. This is both bond issues together. So this is the 2015 bond issue and the bond issue we're talking about tonight stacked on top of one another. So it's two bond issues. Yes. The 2015 is already outstanding. was issued four years ago. That was phase one. So the next page is phase two. Combined. Combined. So if you, look at, if you look at the left-hand column here where it's the 950000 a year approximately, that is the bonds that were issued for phase one four years ago. The middle column, that's the new bonds we're talking about tonight, that these rates are needed to finance. Those stack on top of one each of each other to equal a $1.4 million annual revenue requirement for the district. Did I answer the question? Yes. Okay. And that'd be based on the uh, future usage, the payback? It'd be based on the rates that Andre went through earlier to, I think, the question that you'd asked him, let's hypothetically say, three, four years from now, the continued trend of declining usage, declining customer base continues, you still have this $1.4 million outstanding. You've got to get that repaid from the customers that are still there. All things held equal, yes, you would see a rate adjustment to offset that. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Eric. Uh, transitioning into the long-term control plan, uh, we have several graphs that kind of compare East Chicago to other communities throughout Indiana and also uh, Chicago, which is um, in your backyard. So here is the estimated population of several communities throughout, uh, throughout Indiana and also Chicago, uh, where you can see that East Chicago has 27,000 uh, folks that live here and then ratcheting up uh, from there. Uh, Hammond, uh, that includes also Munster, their sanitary district includes two, two municipalities, Hammond and uh, Munster. Also one of the factors when the EPA and IDEM are looking at long-term control plans is the MHI of those communities. So they're trying to benchmark the improvements that are needed to meet the Clean Water Act and, and to uh, uh, eliminate those sewer overflows. They're looking at the MHI, median household income. So um, you can see that Gary and East Chicago are on the lower end, and that goes up uh, to Chicago at 54,000. So really, the, the, there is a little bit of a range, but they're all within less than 55,000. So even like Evansville and South Bend, just keep a note or a pin there when we get into the other slides as we, as we look at East Chicago compared to Evansville and South Bend. Number of customers served. So East Chicago's on the lower end. Obviously, Chicago, Illinois, being all of Cook County and some surrounding areas, 5.1 million. Now, look at the total or the original cost. So some of these have leapfrogged or gone <coughs> higher, um, and some are proposed to even be higher. That East Chicago's on the low end at 21 million. Now, we took this from the 2012 um, uh, study that uh, Umball, now Baker Tilly, did. And obviously, they still have to design phase three. But as you can see, Gary and Hammond. And Hammond's at $240 million. And I believe they're only about $40 million through that. And their rates will have to be uh, sufficiently adjusted to cover that. Fort Wayne, 
271 million. Evansville, which was, if you remember, their MHI. Um, both Eric and I work for some of these communities. Um, Evansville will more than likely go up to probably about 1.5 billion. In Chicago at 3 billion, probably going to rise some more. <laughs> When we look at the integrated overflow costs uh, divided over uh, per customer, um, you can see East Chicago is about three thousand uh, dollars per customer of that long-term control plan. Evansville and South Bend. Then, it, as we look at that um, cost per customer divided over the MHI. Um, you can still see where their MHI was in that range, um, but their plans are significantly more. Now, customer base and other things factor into it, and um, but you can see um, where those numbers stack up. Uh, Mr. President, Councilman Garcia, on that chart there, um, you got Evans for fail at twenty thousand five hundred twenty-two dollars per customer. Is that what you said? This, this graph? Yes. Yeah, yes, sir. How many, through how many years is that? Their plan is over 24 and a half years. That's the cost of 24. In 24 years, that's the cost? For, uh, yes. And more than likely, as, as, I don't want to speak too far, but sometimes planning level costs don't match up with the cost to actually complete the project. So that's why you'll see some variations in original costs and and future costs, but yet yeah, there in t in actual dollars was 1.1 billion. So that's just estimated at 24 years. Yes, and, just, and that's that's within the consent decree. Yeah, it just, just to me that's just a, a hard number to come by. Cause we ain't got no crystal ball and know what's going to be what's going to happen in 24 years. So and. Well, they're mandated to make those improvements. Oh, yeah, so they, no, that, that's, agreed, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. No, I'm talking about, you said that's what it's going to cost them. Yeah. yeah. It might cost them more because they might have to raise the rates. Correct. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that next slide. So here are the user rates um, for 5,000 gallons for those customers. And Evansville is only four years into their plan. Fort Wayne is... Fort Wayne is... Uh, Fort Wayne's just coming to the end of their current five-year phased rate increase and already talking about their next five years to keep up with their long-term control plan. They've already issued several hundred million dollars related to it. Do you mind if I say one more thing? Um, I wanted to go back to a slide, and I forgot to say this. I apologize when I was talking about the debt, but it was a Councilman Perez's question. I think it was pretty pertinent. Um, find the slide. I'm not going to, similar to Steve, I'm not going to pine uh, as an attorney here and say you can or cannot use the uh, gambling proceeds, but I want to give you some food for thought, whatever you're discussing here. The $2.2 .2 million, which is the over the three phases, the shortfall in revenue requirements, of that, as was pointed out, the debt component on an annual basis, including the debt service reserve funding, is about 554000 To the example I, I believe you gave, Councilman Perez, of could you do a 0% loan from gambling, that would eliminate, if you got, that gets rid of the 2% interest rate. That saves you a little bit over $100,000 a year out of this equation. That lowers your rate increase 2 to 3% out of a 33% rate increase. That doesn't obviously your decision. I just want you to understand getting rid of the interest rate because it's so low already doesn't really move the dial to the impact. Councilman Perez? Maybe you misunderstood what I meant. I wouldn't go forward with the rate increase if we funded it. If we funded it with money that we have, our gaming money is designed for infrastructure. That's what it's designed for. That was its original intent. So if we used our gaming money for this infrastructure, it would be to avoid burdening our residents with the humongous uh, increase, rate increase that you're asking us to do. 
And I apologize if I misunderstood. I thought you said repaying it at a 0% loan. If you're saying no repayment, so just giving the money and sticking there, you wouldn't have the repayment, obviously, of $500,000. I thought you were saying repay it at 0% interest to the gaming fund. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, that is what I said. But at the end of the day, if they couldn't repay it, they can't repay it. I mean, we, we give it to them as a... I, how we do it legally is for up to the attorneys, but the point is I'm trying very hard to make sure we don't strap our residents with a 38% rate increase. Completely understand. I just want to make that clear. If there is a, if it is an agreed to decision that you're going to give the gaming money, again, I'm not saying that's legal or not. That's not my opinion. If you're going to give that and the district signs to repay that over the same 20-year repayment at 0%, so you're charging them zero, zero interest, their user fees still have to be able to repay that unless you're just forgiving that loan. If that's the case, you're only saving 2 to 3% by eliminating that interest on the 38% you talk. That's the point I just want to make. As point well taken. Thank you. Thank you. And, and to Eric's point, that 2 to 3% is about a dollar sixteen on the rates. So we're about... Every hundred thousand, that's a about a dollar sixteen. So, uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Um, we're done with our part of the presentation. <coughs> Councilman Garcia. Yeah, uh, probably not to you, but fa is phase one done already? <laughs> phase one is done. <coughs> when does phase two need to Excuse be? Excuse me, you got to come up to the podium, please. You said phase one is done already, correct? No. Question, which phase? This is design or for the increase rates. of the rates? The design, phase one. Uh, the design has been completed maybe. It started in 2015 and maybe finished in 2016 it's or done. Yeah, right. it done. Phase two, by what year it needs to be done by? Normally, we should be done by January 2020, but we are stuck with the design and the funding, and we are uh, requesting from item uh, uh, like a, a extension. I heard 2021. Is that correct? Yeah. It's going to be 2022. It needs to be done by 2022. No, it's going to be done by 2022. <laughs> Should be. We're filing extension. IDEM has asked us to amend our schedule to reflect when it will be done, and that new schedule will be tendered early next year. After sitting down, is Doug still here? Yeah. After you were part of that discussion, Doug, after sitting down with Kokosing, the contract. Counselor, can you please speak into the mic? They cannot hear you when they're doing well, the minutes, please. After, we spent a lot of time, and it's going to be done in late 2022. Is that correct, Doug? Yeah. Correct. Correct. And we'll be filing, and, and we've told IDEM that, and they've simply asked <coughs> us to file a formal uh, schedule Stitch. amendment. So that's the plan. And then we told him that we, 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 there would have to be a period of time when we judge the effectiveness of phase two. And then, as you heard, phase three has to be studied and scoped. Uh, we're not going to get there before 2025, and we may not get there in 2025. Any other questions? If I, oh, I'm sorry, sir. Um, and then phase three has got to be done by 2032, correct? Yes. So um, this phase two, you know, that comes out to three point whatever a year. If we, um, three point some a year, that we, if we pay that ourselves out of gaming, do you have to pay that all up front or can we pay that? Is that a yearly payment? Well, <laughs> When you float a bond, you get all of the proceeds up front. And you put that in the bank, and the trustee of the bond pays out as you incur the expenses. And um, that's the way it's usually done. Whether it can be done some other way, I've never heard of it. I'm not saying it can. Um, plus, I don't think you can do it legally. I will, I will, I will stake that turf right now. And there's, there's a big reason for that. That reason was sent to you alongside with the other documents you got uh, 
40 CFR 35.2140. It talks about the user charge system. Now, this is federal law. This is federal regulation. The user charge system must be designed to produce adequate revenues required for operation and maintenance, including replacement. It shall provide that each user which discharges pollutants that cause an increase in the cost of managing the effluent or sludge from the treatment works shall pay for such increased cost. User charge system must be based on actual use. The grantee's user charge system based on actual use or estimated use of wastewater treatment services shall provide that each user or user class pays its proportionate share of operation and maintenance, including replacement costs, of treatment works within the grantee service area based on the user's proportionate contribution to the total wastewater loading from all users or user classes. That's what makes, in my opinion, unlawful the application of other funds that are not user charges to a project like this. Councilman Garcia? Yes. Yeah, what I just heard is that that the city has the power to, to raise rates. We have the power, if we have the cash on hand to pay um, a project, we should be able to pay for it. But I know Sanitary District, if they want to, if they need to raise the rates to maintain it, that's another issue. Well, the system is set up so that the users must pay for it. Those users are the people who actually put the effluent into the system. Uh, the people who paid for your gaming revenues are not those people. They're somebody else, <coughs> which is wonderful. Those communities would love to have a large outside source of revenue. But that can't be applied here. Federal law does not allow it. And I don't want, I don't want you to misunderstand what's going on. That's the system that Congress set up to make sure that there would always be funds available from those who actually have to use the system to maintain it, expand it when necessary, replace it, and operate it. Um, so I, I don't, I, I could, I, listen, nobody likes to raise rates. Uh, but we're under a legal compulsion here, in my opinion. Councilman. Secondly, I, just one more thing, a policy issue. Andre, what proportion of revenue comes from industry? I think it's something like 70%, isn't it? Yeah, so um, I believe large, large commercial and industrial make up 60 to 70% 70, 70 uh, uh, of the system flows or usage. Why on earth would you subsidize them by applying millions of dollars of revenues from outsiders so that they don't have to pay it? Because that's what you're doing. And I don't think that is good policy. But you are the policy makers, I'm not. Councilman Medina. In one of the slides and in, in the handouts here, historical trends, uh, 2018 we had a surplus of 2.9 million, am I correct? Go ahead. Uh, 2018. Historical trends. Yeah, so let me speak to that a little bit. So. Um, when you have revenue debt outstanding already, like the 2015, and it's rated, you must have cash reserves on hand. This is operating cash reserves. You can't basically have a structural deficit. So these reserves allow the sanitary district to maintain an A rating, which is really good, actually an increase because of the history of making adjustments to the rates and also maintaining those cash balances. So if anything happens that no one can predict, the act of God or what have you, those reserves are there to take care of that that would be outside the budget. So the, to have revenue debt or have it outstanding, you must maintain healthy cash balances, which the 150 days, based on how S&P scores or ranks the uh, sanitary district is in that range. Okay, in 2018, we had 2.9 million um, in reserve, correct? 
That's the cash balances, okay. yes. And, and how, how, do, how did we generate $2.9 million? Well, was that from user rates? Yes. Purely, user fees? Purely from user from rates. From residential yes. and in industry? Everybody so, paying their, their, what, their sewer bill, correct? Right. So the other thing that I, I um, forgot to mention is within your current bond covenants, you must keep at least two months reserve. Now to have a better rating than that, because what if you have to go back out to the bond market and borrow again? If you have a B double or triple B, it's going to, your borrowing costs are going to be more. Sure, expensive. we don't your we don't know if a bomb is going to yeah. fall on the city and Excuse take me. care of all the sewers. My question was just simply, we had two point nine million dollars that was in reserve generated by user rate fees. Correct. That is correct. Okay, thank you, Councilman Garcia. Yes, um, just getting back to Attorney uh, De Bonis, he said that uh, referenced the uh, casino money. We have a surplus, and a surplus comes from our residents. It comes from users. Um, what's anticipated a surplus? Um, yes. When we go to next year. Yes. I, I could guess you'll have 32 million at the end of the year. That's no, surplus. Yeah. Not we ain't talking about gaming. Reserves. Yeah. Reserves. Okay. And that's and then we ain't talking about casino money. That's just. Casino money, and that's the money we can use for this project. Uh, now you're talking about a legal decision, but it's well, property taxes come from property owners. Property owners are not the same people who use the system. Wow. And I, I, I'll, I'll ask Scott Chen to come yeah. up. Uh, I think you would have major problems trying to apply that to this project. Scott, there's something else you want. Same. Well, uh, thank you. Um, it, this picks up on the the, the, this, the state law piece that's the counterpart to what Mr. Bonus was saying about, about federal law and picks up on the very good questions that Councilman Perez has been hypothesizing about the potential use, for example, of, of gaming revenues. And, and in response to that earlier discussion that, I, that we had when I was up here, we had a, a further discussion about the specific state statute, so apart from the federal law that Mr. Bonus was, was quoting. Um, and we focused specifically on subsection A of that statute, and we talked about the use of the word may. Uh, but I said um, before that that I wouldn't have be comfortable, you know, giving a legal opinion certainly to justify the use of gaming proceeds to for, for wet weather improvements for the sanitary district, for example. I, that, that was what I said. And, and, and the reason, now that I've gone back and looked at the statute, uh, in part is subsection B of the, of the very same statute. So that statute says the board may change fees from time to time. So that, that's parallel with subsection A, which is that the the, the board may, may fix fees for treatment and disposal of, sew, of sewage. But the key is the next part. The, the fees, together with taxes levied by the sanitary district, not the city, must at all, must at all times be sufficient to produce revenue sufficient to pay operation, maintenance, and administrative expenses and to pay the principal and interest on bonds as they become due and payable. So the, 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 that is the part that I had remembered that made me uncomfortable if, if you were to give an opinion on using outside revenue, certainly outside things like gaming revenues, where it's the state statute in addition to the federal law re requires the use of the things, the fees and the, and, the, and, the, and the revenues that are derived from the sanitary district itself. That's the, that's the challenge. I think, in terms of the law. Councilman Garcia? Yeah, let's this, this get rid of the, the, the gaming money. This is a surplus that we have. You know what? Um, we have a surplus. And it's, it's hard for me to fathom that the state's going to twist our arm, the federal government's going to twist our arm to pay extra when we got cash on hand to pay that. And then the user, if we need to use, raise the user's fees to maintain it, you know, that's what we have there uh, as uh, a second arsenal. To maintain it, but uh, behooves me, to, you know, to force us to try to uh, to lend money. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, let me say two things about that. Um, USCPA is very serious about these matters, and uh, they expect IDEM to carry out this policy, and they have chosen to carry it out directly. We have had inspections, we have had reviews from US EPA in the past, and 
there's no reason to believe that's not going to continue. Uh, I would be remiss in my obligations if I said that uh, we should cavalierly take some risk of having uh, the government tell us that what we're doing is wrong and that we have to pay the price for that. Uh, I, I, the system was designed to be able to pay for itself. And uh, you've already heard the good policy reasons why that's a desirable thing. But for sure, we have to do this. And if we don't do it, it's going to be a problem. Secondly, under the state law, it is the Board of Commissioners of the Sanitary District who sets the rates and has to determine the rates and chooses the method of financing. Uh, the council is given an approval role, which is important. I don't minimize it for a moment. But it is the board and the staff of the board at their direction and those of us who serve the board who have assisted it in coming up with a system that abides by all of the laws and means that this project can go forward in the way it should. If you don't act on the supposition that maybe you can use dollars from other sources that you have to pay for this, I think you take a big risk. And uh, that's your risk to take. You are certainly empowered to take those risks. We just want you to understand. Councilwoman Orange. Um, yes, I've been kind of listening to all of this, and that that thirty-two million dollars that we have in surplus, we've spent that about twelve thousand times up here on this council because everything that comes up, uh, spend a thirty-two million dollar surplus. You got a thirty-two million dollar surplus, and that's over and over again. Nobody wants to raise rates. We understand that we got struggling families. I work with them every day in the North Township, and I understand that. But I understand laws also. I understand also that we as a city council did not pass the sanitary budget nor our regular budget, which is our job as, as uh, Councilman uh, Perez always reminds us, the job of the council. We did not pass that. We are looking at uh, a situation where you, we may not even pass the budget for next year. So we're talking about loans and giving people uh, forgiveness of debt and everything when we didn't even do our due diligence by passing sanitary uh, budget, nor did we pass the civil city's budget, which was our prim primary function here on this council, because we was worried about what the firemen thought, because they walked with some and, and, and gave some uh, uh, walk with them during the election time, and some people are already worried about the next election uh, if you uh, raise a rate. The bottom line is people in our community want services, they want to see things just like they see in other communities, whether it's new lighting, whether it's uh, the things that they may not care nothing about other people. I've never lived any place else but East Chicago, Indiana. And I have been here 65 years. That is the best I've ever seen it here. And the, my community, and I don't know about anybody else's, but they want to continue to see services. I don't want to take the surplus we have and spend it all on what should be divided throughout the city. I'm not giving uh, Mattel Steele, who is worth trillions of dollars, a pass because we want to make, prove a point that we shouldn't raise the rates. I don't know if they should have been raised 38% or if they should have been raised 12% or whatever it does to cover the cost. But at the end of the day, uh, People want to fix. Uh, Councilman Francisco just said he didn't want any more uh, sewage in his basement. People want things that have not been done in 100 years in this community to be fixed. This is the most uh, we've ever seen being fixed in our sewer systems and our streets. And it's probably uh, 20 more times that should have been fixed. Over the, I know under two administrations, nothing got done. And that's why we're suffering to have to do this kind of stuff today. I think if you ask a person if they, and like I said, I, I looked at the way the rates are, and if it could have been done with, with uh, half and half, you spend half with casino money and half with, with uh, uh, the uh, sewer users, then so be it. 
if you were looking into that, but just to say that we're not going to do something when you didn't even do your job as uh, council people to turn around and then and even pass the budgets. And we were so worried about one segment of the community that we didn't even do our jobs, then shame on you. And like I said, it, 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 it will come back to come uh, back to bite you in the long run because everybody wants to play to the camera of the con the uh, community. We don't want to charge them five dollars for a parking spot. We don't want to charge them this. We don't want to charge them that. Most people in our city, even if they have to, they will say we want improvements. Even if I have to pay a little bit more, and I'm not saying that this is going to be the exact way to go, but people don't mind paying if they see something is being done. If they don't see things being done, we paid out the nose and things that never got done. People are spending our money and, and uh, doing everything else with it, and we never got a chance to uh, see any improvements. So uh, it, you either voted up or down, but like I said, you didn't even do your job when you were supposed to be passing the budget. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Councilwoman Vasquez? Yes. Um, your presentations were very clear. Um, and we appreciate them. Um, but sometimes when we instill fear in the community, um, not just through um, what's before us tonight, you know, other utility facilities that are getting, we know we're getting increases from NIPSCO and just other things, um, that already has the community, you know, riled up in fear. Um, they could come in and sit in on a meeting and might not understand everything that you're explaining to us here tonight. The bottom line is a lot of the communities live on, you know, strict budgets. We have a lot of seniors, um, and I understand people who can't make it on the, on the, you know, what they receive monthly. Um, what they understand is how much would it cost, in simple terms, how much is it going to cost, you know, a single family home? What's going to be the increase to them? And I have heard nothing but positive things when the community, you know, um, make statements such as, they see where our money is going, you know? And I'm not saying that um, I don't disagree with some of the members of this council stating that if we could use other funds and this and that, but I also believe in following policy. And um, I'm not going to break the law and not follow, you know, an agreement that was entered into in 2007 to um, face future um, penalties and fees that may come before this council at a later date. So I just want to say that um, if the public, you know, understands, I mean, oh, they're hearing the, you know, 35, 40 percent. They, you know, they don't really understand to them what exactly the dollar amount is. So I think that's what the fear is when you don't know how much more your, you know, your budget is going to increase when you're on a fixed income. So I don't know if someone can just tell us, you know, um, what that cost might be in a fa for a family, because that's what they want to hear. Thank you, Councilor Vasquez. Uh, I'll go to this schedule here. Sorry. At, oh, <laughs> sorry, I have big hands, so the thing's really small. So that, let's say East Chicago present. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Z. So this line right here is where it currently is for 5,000 gallon usage. Most typical users throughout Indiana use somewhere between 3,500 to 5,000 gallons. When you start getting higher than that, that's larger commercial, industrial type usage. Phase one, which is based on the rate ordinances uh, scheduled to go into effect January 1, that goes up to $28.41 for the typical user. There's a schedule within the cost of that, that big report that lays it out for every usage by every meter size. I'd have to reference that. I think it's page. Um, yeah. Thank you. Page 25. I was looking. I have it. So like I mentioned in the cost of service study, the percentages can be a little deceiving. It's really the dollar. Mm -hmm. So sometimes a percent, a bigger percentage on a smaller number, but a bigger percentage on a or a smaller percentage on a bigger number, 
that kind of has economies of scale. So phase one would go to 2841 for the typical user, and this is just state averages, other things like that. Phase two, scheduled to go into effect the next January one, that goes up to 30, 33 for 5,000 gallon usage. And then phase three, scheduled to go January one the next year, 3141. Did I, did I appropriately yeah. answer your question? Councilman Garcia. Yeah, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, we all understand it needs to be done, and we all agree. I'm pretty sure we all agree up here it needs to be done. Uh, I think it's just a fashion of paying for it. Uh, and, and nobody's up here trying to break the law or trying to use scare tactics or uh, uh, up here just uh, just saying the wrong things. You know, like this council did its job. You know, people might not like it, but it did its job. The way government works, uh, checks and balances. Um, I think that um, maybe there was some, maybe some options. I don't know if the sanitary district could have gave us some options, or even you know we could go to the finance committee. Uh, you know I got no problem uh, voting for this on first reading, um, and then going to the finance committee and try to discuss some options. You know because there are options out there, and the only thing I'm hearing is no, no, it's just one, and then nobody's clear on the law. You know we have an attorney that tells us one thing. Um, you guys tell us another, um, but um, let's hear some options. Councilman Medina. Well, in my opinion, after hearing uh, everything from the attorneys and the finance people, again, I'm not an attorney, nor am I an accountant, uh, and this is just my opinion, but uh, I'm, I'm led to believe that with respect to federal law and with respect to state law, this must be done. We can't disagree on that. And it must be done with user fees. I'm convinced of that. And if so, we have a reserve of 2.9 million in 2018. 2.9 million. So let's loan, let's borrow, float the bond and borrow and, 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 and be mandated to pay an additional 500,000 a year for that bond issuance. We're still going to be 2.4 million in reserve. I don't. I don't see the need to raise the fees if we already have reserve. That's just my opinion. Again, with respect to federal law and, and state law, the fees are there. The reserve money is there, which was generated by the fees. Fees of the people of East Chicago and industry combined. Councilman, uh, you are correct. In five years, though, you would run out of money in your reserves. So the bond, I'm assuming, Andre, tell me if I'm wrong, is going to require you have a certain amount of coverage, that your revenues are greater than your ex your expenses. The only way I know to do exactly what you're talking about would be to substantially change the pilot so that there was no longer money being written from the sanitary district to the general fund. And then I think you might be able to regain your coverage ratio. Thank you. Councilwoman Orange. Dr. Z, could you step up to the podium? Uh, okay, so the average user, if they could, if they called in like tomorrow or called to the what, would you be able for somebody there be able to tell them what the increase as of now would be? Not if uh, like what uh, Rich was saying to cover with the uh, surplus over there. At, would they be able to call? If I call tomorrow and I said, you look at my bill right now. This is what the increase can you would you be able to tell them a guesstimate amount of what the increase would be? Would somebody be able to tell them? So maybe that would alleviate the uh, like council uh, woman that's what I said the fear that a person is, is going from $28 to $97. I don't want to speak for um, city utilities, but typically at, at the billing office, there's a, a billing sheet where you can look at the proposed rates, look at your typical usage because they have munis that should be able to give you real-time readings now that you're going to an automated meter reader system. So you should be able to at least gauge if you have a typical bill around 3,000 gallons. Let's say, based on the information we've provided, you should be able to know what phase one is, phase two, and phase three. I'll give you an example. Uh, for, maybe for the average users, 
uh, the use maybe uh, in the city like 3,000 gallons. Because we, we, we did uh, studying with the engineering department and I reviewed the design. So most of the homes they use like around like 3,000 gallons, unless it's like multi apartments. So this is the, the average, like between 2,500 and 3,000, this is the most average. Um, really that you see like 5,000, 6,000 gallons, unless it's like two or three buildings. Any other questions? Uh, I just want to add something, maybe. I just wanted to add, I just wanted to, add to the, what was spoken by both of them, because I've seen this in other communities going through the long-term control plans, where a cheat sheet just gets created for the call center. Now, I'm not going to speak to the staffing and if they have availability to do that, but you can look at, because the difference is what's your flow and what's your meter size. So if somebody calls in, any resident says, I'm a 5 8 inch meter, my last month's bill is 3,400 gallons, what would my bill be under this? They can go look at that cheat sheet and tell them exactly what their bill would be. I don't know what the capacity is to handle that, but th that's been done in other communities that we've worked with, for sure. And if I may, can I add one other? Somebody was throwing out one of the council uh, persons about options. I want to see options. Um, I know, Steve, you know, you've looked through our cost of service, and, and you guys, if you take this to the finance committee, and this goes back to my earlier point, I don't want to belabor <coughs> it, because I think, Steve, you actually mentioned this very early on in the presentation. If you take the whole $554,000 out of here, you just get that money somewhere else, whether it's the reserves, the gambling fund, whatever. That takes this 38% rate adjustment down to about 30% or 29%. That's a material decrease, don't get me wrong. I just don't want anyone to be under the misunderstanding. You guys go find the 7.7 .7 million and this goes away. There's still an almost a 30% rate increase sitting there for operations, pilot, et cetera. Councilman Garcia. Yeah, Mr. President, just like I said, I ain't got no problem uh, voting for this on first reading. Um, this is a lot to, to absorb. Um, none of us on this council are experts in the sanitary district and his financing and his laws. Um, I have no problem going this on um, first reading as long as it goes to the um, finance committee and we discuss it. Any other questions? Councilwoman Orange. Councilwoman uh, Garcia, what, when you're going to have your um, public safety, we could have it, uh, the meetings back to back, and we won't have to schedule two meetings. So just let me know when you're going to have your meeting. I'll schedule this one right behind it. If, if it flows together, it flows together then. Uh, but I'm meeting with the chief um, Wednesday um, afternoon or evening. Um, this one. This, this one, Wednesday. I guess. So. But you probably wouldn't have it before Thanksgiving anyway, so it'll probably no. be next week. Right. So if you let me know, we'll do them back to back. That way, council people can come at one time. That, that sounds good. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? Oh, oh, Councilwoman question. there a, Yes. Is there a time frame on this when we have to? Yeah, we have to do the closing. I, I have to be traveling next uh, December the 3rd to Indianapolis, uh, the city, to sign the pre-closing. So we, we, we don't have much more time. So we have to close maybe before. I want to catch up. Uh, so SRF, actually, State Revolving Fund, who you're getting the funds from, actually already has your closing date set for um, December 7th. 3rd. Third pre closing and maybe 17th. 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 The closing is the 17th. There's a pre closing scheduled for December 3rd. 3rd. We'll be that becomes important. State revolving fund will not close your loan after December 18th or 19th. So if you, rates aren't adopted, that pushes us in to the earliest we can close is then in January. Rates have to be adopted before we can have that closing, though. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to committee reports. Do we have any committee reports? Oh, no. I've got that. That's fine. Thank you so much. Yeah, we were still. <laughs> it's been what? An hour, two hours. <laughs> like Hammond. <laughs> Clerk Santos, do we have any committee reports? Oh, Do we have any board reports? <laughs> Do we have any ordinances on first reading? Yes, ordinance 19-0027, sponsor Mayor Anthony Copeland, an ordinance enacting a 
proposed amendments to the system of the user rates and charges for support of the operation and maintenance of the East Chicago Sanitary District. So move on first reading, Mr. President. Second. Motion was made by Councilman Garcia, seconded by Councilwoman Walker to your ordinance 19-0027 on first reading. I hope we don't have any discussion on this, but do we have any discussion? <laughs> Clerk Santos, roll call, please. Walker. Yes. Vasquez. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Orange. Yes. Medina. No. Perez. No. Franciski. Yes. Clerk Santos, any ordinances on second reading? No, Mr. President. Any ordinances on third reading? No, Mr. President. Do we have any resolutions? Resolution 19-0016, sponsor Mayor Anthony Copeland, a resolution providing for additional funding for the city's home ownership incentive program. Good evening, Mr. President. Comment. Good evening. Uh, Councilman. So, so moved, Mr. President. And Councilman at large. Moved. Okay. There's an ordinance in front of Excuse you. Excuse me. Can yes. I get a second, please? Second. <laughs> Go ahead, Frank. Okay. Frank Rivera, City of East Chicago, the Primary Development Executive Director. I'm here today to uh, talk to the council. Uh, good evening, Mr. President and, and council women and men. Um, I'm here to discuss uh, a resolution in which um, we're asking for, uh, for your permission on a program that all of us are very aware of and is very popular in terms of uh, increasing our appropriation of currently at 350000 to another 150000 for this year. And the purpose for that is because I gave some reports <coughs> to the young lady over here, and hopefully you have the reports. They all have. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So eventually, uh, if you look at your first report, you'll see that uh, we're about $340,000 already in the account in terms of our trip, tr the chip tracking is the blue and yellow uh, particular report. And um, currently I only have $1,250 left. And all of the yellow criteria that I highlighted, that criteria will show you that's $10,000 each for each individual. I didn't put names in here to keep confidentiality uh, at, at bay. And so eventually we're asking for that additional money. And then also in the resolution, we're looking for us to be planning in the future because if you look at the other report there's another report there and it's the one that shows you with the uh, numbers concerning uh, our inception of the program when the program was incepted in 2012 all the way to 2019 and I'm including both TIF and CHIP and I did uh, give uh, definitions on the bottom so that way you can define what they both mean basically you're providing dollars in terms of people who are interested in moving here in East Chicago. And also providing incentives of $5,000 more for employees of the city of East Chicago. And if you look at your report, you'll see that our grand total is 286 families have moved here who are taxpayers, who are eventually going to pay the user fees if we do go there. <laughs> <laughs> then also at the grand total of $3,087,867 in terms of the program's total expenditure uh, of what we spent out there. And so eventually we're asking you to keep this program going because it's all across the cities for every district. So we know that it's, it's been very successful. And so we're hoping that you can go ahead and provide that for us. Now in 2020 and 2021, we're asking for $500,000 rather than the 350 because we're always coming back to you because the program's successful. We want to continue this so that way we're not coming all the time to you. So if I could. Any questions? <coughs> Councilman Garcia. Yeah, uh, so to end off the year, you need an additional how much? Uh, well, the contract set up with the with the uh, Board of Works currently at three hundred fifty thousand. But every year, if you look at the reports that I provided you, especially the one with the uh, homeowners incentive program numbers, you'll see that we're always almost exceeding that amount. If not, we're coming to the end of the year with people who are wanting to close and I get to that point where I only have like a thousand or I got four or five thousand whatever may be the case and so I'm just planning ahead asking for the 150,000 now and asking for 2020 and 2021 in the future for 500,000 so then that way we're not coming back and forth and we can continue the services with the so what you ask Chicago. for is uh, for is the amount of how many people you got closing in December 
Uh, I got about 70,000, but it, you never know if one of them, if you see they're highlighted in yellow, it could be a city employee. <laughs> Because a city employee, we're talking 15, 20, I mean, 15,000 to 30,000. We don't know if it's brand new home, whatever may be the case. But the way it's, it, it reaches right now is that we're doing very successful. Mm -hmm. Is there a cutoff? Uh, so you're able to cut uh, in December? Usually, usually the cutoff is when the money runs out. But we don't want the money to run out. Mm -hmm. We want it to be able to extend it so that we, there's a continuous loop going in terms of the process. So then that way our families here can take benefit of it. Okay. <coughs> yes, Medina. Is this additional uh, appropriations? Uh, it's already budgeted in the contract. It's, it's budgeted open-ended? Open Council of Shepard? We use that for sewers? Attorney Buscemi? Yes. already sufficient gaming contractual funds appropriated to pay the 350 that's already been committed. You're asking for the council to simply concur that 500000 instead of 300000 can be spent this year for 2019. I think that's what I'm saying. That's yes. What you're asking. Yes, that's what I'm saying. It's already appropriate. Council. Right. It's already appropriate <coughs> 350. However, right. your resolution to us is also next year. Yes, in 2021. Yes. So I assume you would also then be asking that for the 20 budget, mm -hmm. the 21 budget, that the council concur yes. up to $500,000 of gaming contractual can be used for this particular program. Right. The 2021 budget won't be enacted until next year. Okay. So I just have a comment. Councilwoman Francis. Yeah. I just want to say that the program is very successful because I know quite a few families who have, you know, participated. And East Chicago must be doing something right for people to want, you know, to move here. And when you have real estate um, companies calling you, asking you if you're interested in selling your home, it means that there's a list of people that are waiting to get into to the city. So Absolutely. it's a great program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Clerk Santos, roll call, please. Walker? Yes. Yes. Garcia? Yes. Orange? Yes. Medina? Yes. Perez? Yes. Francis? Yes. Resolution passes. <laughs> Moving on to old business. Do we have any old business? Moving on. Do we have any new business? Councilman Garcia. I want to wish everybody happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Moving on to public expression, do we have any comment cards? No, Mr. President, we do not. Mr. President, may I thank the council for their very kind attention and uh, their excellent questions. I just want to underline the fact that bond closing in this favorable financing schedule, we need to get this done. By the time of the next council meeting, we need to be passed. Thank you very much. Best wishes for Thanksgiving. That would not be part of the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so move, Mr. President. Okay. The motion to adjourn. So move. Motion was made by Councilman Garcia, seconded by Councilman Medina. Walker. Walker. Yes. Vasquez. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Orange. Yes. Medina. Yes. Perez. Yes. Francis. Yes. Good night.